Welcome to the Outdoor Emergency Care presentation for Scene Size Up. This is Chapter 7 in your textbook. And welcome to the Outdoor Emergency Care class. In this first presentation, we're going to talk about how you approach a situation where a person is injured or ill and you've arrived as a ski patroller to handle the situation. As a quick orientation to the in-person class sessions, our expectations for the classroom are that it will be left immaculately clean. We are in class at the time the custodian would normally be cleaning the room, so we need to make sure that all the chalkboards and whiteboards are erased and clean, chairs are put back, tables are put back, and that all debris is clear from the classroom. All equipment is to be put away, ready for use, just the way you would want to find it if you needed it for an emergency call. Restrooms are at the front and rear of the building. And when we're out in the hallways or elsewhere in the building for hands-on practical sessions, we need to make sure that other people using the building have free, easy access to the hallways. So please make it a point to get out of their way so that we don't have any complaints about our class. So when we approach a situation where a person is injured or ill, we refer to the process that we follow as patient assessment. And as we assess the patient, we may find life-threatening conditions and we need to stop and treat those immediately. So when we're talking about patient assessment, we're including those life-saving treatments as part of the process. For the purposes of this OEC class, please bear in mind we're teaching you two things. How to do this in order to pass the final exam of this class and how to do it in the real world. And these are mostly the same, but not entirely. So we'll try to make clear what is specifically for the test and what is actually crucial when you have a real patient in front of you. When you're taking the practical exam, the evaluator watching you treat the patient has a clipboard with a checklist of the steps required. And those checklists are in the back of each chapter in your textbook. It's gonna be important for you to be able to talk through those steps out loud ideally in the correct order so the evaluator can be sure that you're not missing anything. Certain steps on the checklist are called CPIs or critical performance indicators. And these are safety concerns or life-saving treatments that must be done. So if you miss one of those, you fail the exam. At all times in this class and for the scenarios we'll be talking about, our first priority will be your safety, safety of your fellow rescuers, the safety of bystanders who are not involved, and the continued safety of the person who's already injured. During this class, or at any point during your ski patrol career with us, if you feel something is unsafe, please just say stop. Notify an instructor or supervisor, and we'll get the problem taken care of. Although ski patrolling does have inherent risks and we sometimes do certain things to get the job done or to save a life, we're committed to minimizing those risks as much as possible. The types of situations you'll encounter as a ski patroller are divided into two major categories. Most of the time you'll be dealing with routine injuries or illnesses that are painful but not life-threatening. Much more rarely, but still very possible to encounter, are the life-threatening injuries or illnesses, where what you do as a patroller in the first few seconds will make all the difference. The assessment skills we'll be talking about in this presentation will help you to differentiate the routine calls from these life-threatening situations so that you can react correctly. Success in both of these situations will depend on your preparation as a rescuer. This includes your training in this initial class, required annual refresher training every fall, daily training on shift at the ski area, and other training that you'll have the opportunity to participate in. You also need to have the correct equipment, know how to use that equipment, and make sure that it's set up correctly. It's also important to have the mindset of being a rescuer. Once you have this training, and that includes the CPR certification, which you all just received, you need to keep in your mind that if something happens, you will probably be the best trained and most well-prepared person to take care of it. 
While you're on duty as a ski patroller, you need to be ready to respond to the worst possible scenarios. As you go through this presentation, you'll notice the way we describe the size up and primary assessment is slightly different and more detailed than the way it is in the textbook. The way that we are presenting it here is consistent with the national EMS curriculum, with how these skills are performed by EMTs, paramedics, and emergency room doctors. If you perform the skills the way we discuss here, you'll be able to pass the patient assessment station on any practical exam up through the paramedic level, and you'll be well prepared for how this is done every day in the trauma bay at DHMC. While you're on duty as a ski patroller, your size up of the scene should really begin before the call even ever happens. You're gonna be aware of what the snow conditions are, the types of skiers that are on the mountain, any special events that are in progress. So you should have a decent idea what sorts of injuries are gonna be likely on any given day. When the call actually does come into the dispatch desk, your size up of the situation starts with the information you get from the caller. What trail is it on? What is the reported nature of injury? How upset does the caller sound? And this will help the team on duty decide what resources to send to the call and will help you to anticipate what you're gonna find when you get on scene. For every patient you encounter from this moment forward, whether it's a scenario station in this class, the practical exam, or a real call, you'll perform this scene size up as soon as you arrive and can look at the scene and the patient. For the purposes of scenarios and the practical exam, you'll verbalize this out loud and in order so the person holding the clipboard can check you off and give you credit. On a real call, this happens silently in your head and you still need to think about all of these points. So when you walk in the room for a practical station and they tell you, you arrive on scene, you find a skier down, you may begin, you'll look at the scene and say something like this. The scene is safe. I have my standard precautions. I see one patient. He's responsive, sitting up. The mechanism of injury looks minor. I have the resources I need for this call right now. Patrol dispatch, I'm on scene. Again, our first priority is the safety of the scene. Think about the hazards that you encounter on a ski trail. Immediate concerns are pretty much always going to include people crashing into you from above, slipping and falling and hurting yourself while working on the patient, falling or sliding further down the hill, etc. If you get called to the snowmaking building or the snowcat garage, you could encounter carbon monoxide, electrical wires, heavy machinery or objects that could move and hurt you. Depending on where you end up working as a patroller, you could also possibly have to deal with avalanche hazards, angry, aggressive patients, dogs, wild animals, etc. At this point, you want to take action to secure the scene, mitigate these hazards as much as possible. On a ski trail, usually you want to cross skis uphill of the patient if the snow is soft enough to stick a ski into, or have a helper or bystander stand uphill from you in direct traffic. For example, in the case of carbon monoxide, you'd avoid entry, call the fire department, open doors and windows, or you may be able to emergently remove the patient from the hazardous area, like dragging someone away from a burning car. Do whatever you can do to make the scene safe enough to be able to work on the patient without becoming part of the problem yourself. For all patients, you'll be taking standard precautions, or BSI, which stands for Body Substance Isolation. We want to protect ourselves from diseases that may be transmitted by blood and other bodily fluids. The rule of thumb being, if it's wet or sticky and it's not yours, you don't want to touch it. Usually standard precautions will consist of nitrile gloves, but depending on the situation, you may also need eye protection, respiratory protection, or head-to-toe fluid protection. In a ski patrol uniform, you're well protected because you're wearing waterproof outerwear, neck gaiter, goggles, helmet, and work gloves. Next thing to determine as you arrive on the scene is how many patients do you have? 
Usually there's only one patient, but you must be alert to the possibility that there may have been a collision between two or more skiers. Someone may be down off the edge of the trail. It's also possible for a bystander to develop a medical emergency while you're dealing with the situation you were originally called for. It's also possible that you could encounter a mass casualty incident or MCI, such as this chairlift derailment that happened at Sugarloaf, Maine in 2010. As you arrive on scene, quickly look at your patient or patients, make a good guess as to whether they're responsive, meaning awake or unresponsive, unconscious. In this case, the patient's sitting up, rubbing his knee, so the patroller already has a good idea of what's happening. If the patient were lying motionless in the snow, the level of concern is increased. We use the term mechanism of injury to refer to what happened that caused the injury, what speeds and forces were involved, how much energy was absorbed by the patient. Often you can get an idea of this from looking at the scene before you hear the story from the patient. If you find a huge yard sale, the patient's skis are up the hill, or if the patient's found unresponsive under the chairlift or at the bottom of a cliff, it gives you a clue as to how far they may have fallen. Now that you've taken a look at the scene, you should be able to start thinking about what resources you're going to need to handle the situation. If there's something you're obviously definitely gonna need, you wanna call for it in your initial radio call on scene. For example, if you find the patient down off the edge of the trail and you're gonna need a rope to get them out, you wanna call for that. If the patient's obviously severely injured and there's blood everywhere, you may wanna start the ambulance rolling towards the ski area right away. Typical resources that we would call for when needed would be the toboggan, which has standard splinting equipment with it, a backboard for removing severely injured patients, the oxygen kit, which contains our airway and breathing equipment, and some other trauma supplies, and then obviously the ambulance and the helicopter. So your radio call to patrol dispatch confirms you've arrived on scene and allows the dispatcher to document the time that you arrived, which could be important if there's ever a legal question about how long it took us to get there. So you're gonna call on scene right away before you even get involved in talking to the patient. After you've done your assessment, you'll be able to update dispatch with the patient's age and gender, what injuries you've found, and any additional resources that you've learned that you need through your assessment. Also going to call on the radio once we leave the scene and we're transporting and once we get the patient down off the hill into the aid room or into the back of an ambulance. By the time you're making your on-scene radio call, you've sized up the scene in your mind or out loud for the clipboard person in a practical station and you're making a general impression of what you have. Basically, is this a critical life-threatening patient? or is this a routine patient? And how are you going to approach this? At this point, you've concluded your scene size up and you're going to go ahead and approach your patient and you can begin your primary assessment. And that will be covered in the next presentation.